down here on the bench we've got the Breitling um, that you saw previously. This uh, lovely little Breitling Cadet with the Venus 188 chronograph movement. One of the problems uh, when it came to me was that the stem would not seat. A replacement stem had been sourced. The old one I believe was broken but it wouldn't seat in the movement. So having now removed the dial and gotten into the keyless work side it was it was evident initially that the setting lever just here was misplaced it was actually it had actually come out of its spring detent and this was one of the reasons that it wouldn't seat properly and this happens quite often with um, with setting levers if the detent the spring detent at the back isn't pushed in or in this case if the screw isn't unscrewed to an adequate level and if if you try to force the stem in it will quite often catch a hold of the lug on the setting lever pushing it that way and making it swivel so as you're pushing the bottom that way you're making the top swivel that way and it pops out of its spring detent there so that's something to watch for when you're uh, removing and replacing stems on a movement because you can't correct this without removing the hands and the dial obviously and as you'll have seen in the previous videos another problem was the fact that the fourth wheel extended pivot is bent the one that the wheel sits on which comes out here and that's that's bent and it's something i'm going to have to try and straighten having now gotten the stem to fit you can see that the balance is swinging it's very lackluster so hopefully uh, a good clean will will help that no end but having uh, reseated the setting lever and got the stem to sit in there properly and you pull it out to the hand setting position and all is well there you can see it turning the minute wheel and the cannon pinion the hour wheel is uh, is already removed because obviously that's just a slip on fit but when you push it into the winding position it's winding partially and then catching and slipping and I don't know if that's if you can actually hear that because I'm using the onboard microphone just now but I'm just going to scoot in close and having had a look through the loop you can actually see that the problem is the winding pinion down here closer view of the setting lever here and this is the little detent where the setting lever had become disconnected and as you can see as you pull that that moves the clutch to engage with the hand setting mechanism over here and then as you click that back in it then allows it to engage the winding pinion now if I turn that winding pinion it's you can see that there's wear on some of those teeth and if I flip this over so that you can see the rear side where it contacts the crown wheel just down here as you turn that you can see it catches and moves so far and then it will slip now the wheels on the crown wheel uh, the, the teeth on the crown wheel look okay that's um, a cursory inspection without removing it and checking the underside but you can see hopefully That that's slipping and it will work to a degree but obviously too much of that is just going to make it worse and worse so ideally that is going to need replacement possibly the crown wheel but we'll have to see when I take that apart so that's where we're at just now and we're going to start disassembling the rest of this movement one more little thing before I do start with the disassembly is you can see if you look at the chronograph works here that this is very much uh, the same kind of principle as the lander on that you'll have seen in my previous video if you've watched that the 48 and it has it's a cam lever chronograph uh, rather than column wheel and the main difference being that the start stop is operated by the top button which has a two part lever rather than a one piece one like the lander ons so you push in the top one this disengages the hammers and engages the drive wheel and with the drive wheel off the extended fourth wheel pivot which is currently removed here 
driving the chronograph hand and then a little dog moves the minute wheel in one minute increments and to stop that you press this again which moves the hammer to the halfway position and disengages the drive wheel over here and then to fully reset it you press the lower button which then re-engages the hammers on the hearts of the chronograph wheels there. Down here you see I've removed the balance cock and the pallet fork. Whenever you're stripping a chronograph before you begin to strip the chronograph components it's best to um, to let down the power uh, usually there's an access hole on this type of chronograph. In this case it's this one down here. It's actually very very hard to see but you can just see the click as I turn the crown there, just come into view. And you have to get a very thin, um, very thin item to hold that while you let the power down. So let down the power, remove the balance cock and remove the pallet fork. The reason for this is as you're removing the chronograph components, there's a possibility that you can catch and move the chronograph driving wheel, which in turn will push power through the intermediate wheel and then the driving wheel of the pinion, which sits here on the fourth wheel, which will directly hammer against the pallet stones. And you want to minimize that risk by just removing them out of the way, because if you knock that and it gives it a sudden impulse of power, there's a possibility you can knock or damage your pallet fork or your pallet stones. But the point of this bit here is to show you that fourth wheel pivot, which is just here. The one that I mentioned was bent. It's actually bent much worse than I thought and I don't know as yet if I will be able to successfully straighten that but you can see as I turn that there the severity of the bend in it. Let me try and get a side view for you. There you go kind of like a crank handle on an old-fashioned car at the moment. Uh, so you can see there it's actually bent in two directions. It's not just a straight bend, which is what I thought it was originally. The chances are, my suspicion is that this happened whilst seating the chronograph driving wheel onto the extended pivot. And this is why it's very, very important to use something like a staking set, some means of holding it and pressing the wheel on straight and true. Because if you try pressing it on by hand, it's so, so easy to just slip over to one side um, if you're sort of pressing it on, say, with the back of your tweezers, for example, or with a, a hand pressing tool. You're pressing on and then all of a sudden you go like that. So easy to do. And then, of course, you try and bend it back and, and the result is something like this. I will try and straighten it to, uh, to try and cut down on the uh, parts cost to repair this because it's already going to need a new uh, winding pinion, if not a crown wheel. So we'll see what we can do. Um, fortunately, it's not an uncommon movement. Venus uh, chrono movements are relatively common. Uh, but yeah, you can see that's, that's very, very badly bent. So with the balance and the pallet fork removed, for safety reasons as I explained, the strip down of the chronograph components begins with the pushers. First of all, I remove the reset pusher as that's a very, very simple one to get to and replace the securing screw. Along the way, wherever possible, as mentioned in the lander on video, when stripping a chronograph, I will replace the screws in their respective holes. The reason for this is that there are many different sizes and shapes of screws, some shouldered, some not, etc. And it's very, very hard to mix two up between them. And you'll note on the lander on service that I did, I did actually find that a couple of the screws had been put in the wrong place on reassembly. So the, um, the two screws that hold the chronograph pusher levers are left-handed threads as denoted by the three lines on the screw head and the pivoting screw in the middle of the start pusher uh, that has to be removed that's a standard right hand thread and that's removed first because it, uh, part of that fits underneath the cover plate that you can see there by the stem. So both of those are removed. 
The next item to be removed for safekeeping is the minute jumper spring. These can be quite fragile, especially the ones on the lander on. If you'll remember from the 48 service, uh, that one was badly bent and had to be replaced. These are a little bit sturdier. They're more of a spring steel, but still quite fragile. So it's important to get them out of the way. Here I'm removing the shaped spring which returns the pushers and that as you can see is a specific shape and fits in in a specific direction and this just fits into the slot covering both of the chronograph pusher slots. Next to be removed is the hammer spring. This spring engages in the notches that you can see on the bottom of the plate there. I don't have a technical diagram and accordingly don't know the exact technical names for these and uh, the reassembly is just going through a degree of common sense in as much as you remove the components such as springs which hold tension on items before you remove the items themselves so for example here after removing the spring I've um, moved the hammer to its unlocked position and I'm now removing the whole hammer assembly likewise here the spring just shown there is removed first this is the one that engages the intermediate wheel between the chronograph driving wheel and the minute wheel to move the minute wheel round in one minute increments via the jumper As you can see this one's fighting me a little bit and you can see the action of this intermediate wheel with the spring removed. With the tension relieved from there, the next thing I remove is the chronograph bridge. This being the part that bridges across the chronograph runner and the minute wheel. after which the chronograph runner and the minute wheel are removed taking care to pull them straight up through the plate so as not to bend the pivots And then the chronograph runner spring, which is the small spring that sits underneath the chronograph runner to give it a little bit of upward tension, is removed. Uh, these are small and quite fragile, so care must be taken when handling them. And here the intermediate wheel assembly is removed and then this is further stripped down on the bench separately into its component parts
Apologies for slightly obscuring the view there. the return spring for the tension spring for the intermediate wheel that connects the fourth wheel to the chronograph runner and again this is disassembled into its component parts while it is still fixed to the bridge uh, on reassembly however it will be assembled prior to the whole thing being fitted back to the bridge so that both of the oil sink holes on the wheel can be oiled first of all. And then the securing screw is removed and it's important to, um, to check carefully and ensure that the screws that you're turning are not the adjustment screws which are eccentric screws because if these are moved you will need to reset everything working through from the fourth wheel through to the chronograph components and you can see there that this is a friction fit over one of the eccentric screws that makes these adjustments which I'm just wiggling free there And the final part of the chronograph works is this sub bridge uh, or intermediate bridge as it were which is just above the main watch uh, barrel bridge components and is held in place by two screws as you see here. And once those are removed the plate itself just lifts away like so. And that's the completed chronograph side disassembly. Next the remainder of the watch movement will be disassembled. So thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video.